So in reviewing the cabin in the woods, there are no wrong answers. Um, somebody set us in a direction. Do you think you could just talk about how in the movie they put like different substances or things in the air to change how the people act? Do you think you could just talk about that and maybe how it relates to substance use and maybe like psychosis? Yeah, so uh, I, th I think the low hanging fruit here would be to um, kind of, and just to reframe exactly what you just said, uh, what potential substances can result in um, psychotic symptoms in general or uh, paranoid features in particular. So what, uh, what would comprise our short list? Any guesses? There are five and a half. So I'm going to ask you a real question as a hint, um, and I th think we may have covered this, but who here has seen Paranormal Activity? I think we did talk about this because I remember a similar response when previously asked. We need five or six substances that can induce psychosis. So um, pull this out of the cabin in the woods, and let's have any patient present to you with evidence of paranoia. And uh, we'll even say paranoid delusion, where the focus is on the delusion that is a fixed belief uh, that is not reality-based. Uh, there are several subtypes. Uh, we reviewed those. Uh, they conform to the acronym JPEGS, the P representing persecutory or paranoia. So here's an individual that presents. Before one would consider an illness like schizophrenia, as clinicians, we always have to rule out the direct and physiologic uh, effects of a, a substance or an underlying medical condition. And at this point, we're trying to investigate the potential role of substances. Any guesses as to what substances we have to consider here as clinicians? LSD or MDMA? Perfect. So, uh, we'll, we'll, um, both are correct. Both LSD um, and NDMA um, would represent two of those five or so substances. Uh, MDMA, I'm um, oh, sorry, NDMA is a stimulant, right? So ecstasy is a uh, synthetic amphetamine. Uh, and any stimulant can induce psychotic behavior. Uh, LSD is an example of a psychedelic, which is a subset of a hallucinogen. All hallucinogens can induce psychosis. So you've got two of the five already. We're 40% there. Both the answers are correct. Three more. The uh, uh, The um, I couldn't quite hear you. Inhalants. Inhalants, perfect. Right, that's exactly right. Inhalants uh, also come in different subtypes. Um, there are um, uh, aerosols, uh, there are, uh, are solvents, there are gases, and finally there are nitrites. Uh, those are the four subtypes of inhalants. The common variable here is that is the it is the vapors from any of these four subtypes that result or can result in uh, psychotic symptoms, including but not limited to paranoia. So, inhalants, good. Two more. Methamphetamine would be in the stimulant class. Yep. Mm -hmm. All stimulants can induce psychosis. Alcohol. Good. Exactly right. You know, anytime, uh, I, and I think for all intents and purposes, and there really is only one 
exception. But for all intents and purposes, anything alcohol can do, the sedative hypnotics can do as well. So that's why I said there was five and a half. We have to think of the sedative hypnotic agents such as the benzodiazepines here as well. But if you understand the basic premise that anything alcohol does, these sedatives do just as well, um, with um, just one or so exceptions. Um, uh, we are now down to a single agent now. The one I haven't heard yet is cannabis. All right, cannabis. All right, so for those of you who will watch Paranormal Activity, uh, here is one of the main characters, and Micah's name uh, serves as an acronym for the agents that we just discussed, with the M referring to uh, methamphetamine, just remembering that any stimulant can induce psychosis, methamphetamine, to fit the acronym, is but one example, followed by inhalants, cannabis, alcohol, and benzos, as well as hallucinogens. So. Watch the movie, get yourself to identify with that character, and you will never forget the short list of substances that can induce psychotic behavior. From this list, any stand out to you that might apply to our fictional case called The Cabin in the Woods? Yeah, I think that's one perspective to take, that anything that is going on in this movie, the plot of The Cabin in the Woods perhaps is being told through a single perspective and not a third party point of view, which is what we often adopt. If we were to challenge ourselves and think, no, this is a first person perspective, and then, then consider what character are we viewing this Cabin in the Woods through, the stoner, I think, would be an easy pick in as much as this, this may all be a product of his psychotic mind, his psychosis having been induced by the uh, cannabis, which is literally written in the script. If we, if we, on the other hand, choose to view this movie through the normal third-person perspective, um, might there be another substance that we'd have to consider? How are these teens made to become paranoid? What is it that they're actually exposed to? What do you what do you see unfold in this film? Hypothetically, I have not seen this film. I dare say that live streaming. I've seen this film more than once. Hypothetically, I've not seen this film. I'm hearing that there's paranoia among this group of teens, and I'm thinking, oh, it's because every time they um, uh, eat something, or uh, every time they uh, put their head on their pillow, they're exposed to this toxin. Um, can you enlighten me? Can you be a little bit more specific? How do they get to behave? the way the organizers and the director needs them to behave. Somebody blows zombie dust in their face? I don't exactly remember what it is, but I do remember at some point it said to like, the people directing said to like put something in the room. I'm not sure what it was called. Mm -hmm. so. What did it look like? It was like, mm, uh, I'm not sure. Anyone? I think at one point it was pheromones. Yeah, yeah. It was a vapor. Right. If it, and if it's a vapor, what, albeit symbolically or metaphorically, might that be consistent with looking down at your short list? What substance is this? Um, inhalants? Yeah. Yeah. 
not nearly as straightforward as Cannabis, which again is in the script. But from a slightly different perspective, this movie does provide us a bit of an opening to discuss more than one substance, right? And I think um, the next substance we would have to consider here, given the, the route of administration, if you will, as a vapor inhaled, would be the inhales. In addition to paranoia, is there any other type of, types of behavior that you observed among these, uh, these teens? And for those of you who are horror fans, the correct answer lies in any horror film about any cabin in the woods. Why is, why is a cabin in the woods such a trope for American horror? What are the, what are the teens doing? Uh, isolation, yes. I'll give you isolation. What else? They usually like uh, breaking the rules. What rule are they breaking that their mom and dad told them not to do? Well, probably like drinking and, and like uh, doing drugs and having sex. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that is a prevailing theme in this. It, that is a prevailing theme in any cabin in the woods. Um, and of, of course, there have been more recent movies that have broken these long-standing rules. But I will give you that um, um, Laurie Strode is still alive and well today. Because way back in 1978, in the original Halloween, she was the only virgin. Right? That's that's the final girl trope, right? And that's that's in every horror movie, not every, of course, um, but that is a trope in several horror horror movies, and certainly horror movies that are set to a cabin in the woods. It's noteworthy whether you're a horror buff or you're just trying to learn some psychiatry, because there happens to be a subset of inhalants in which not only can there be the induction of psychosis, such as paranoia, but also the induction of sexual behavior. And that subtype are the nitrites. So in an aerolized, an aerolized form of vapor, I'm sorry, aerosolized form, a vapor, the nitrites can not only render someone paranoid, but also increase their uh, sexual activity as well. So this might in fact be about nitrites, specifically or more, and more generally, the inhalants. A um, couple of words, um, getting to what you're most likely to be tested on now that we've kind of gotten to a point of considering that the cabin in the woods may be uh, depicted behavior induced by s substances, including nitrites and cannabis, right? For the inhalants, of which the nitrite is one example, um, individuals with inhalant use disorder and who might present with inhalant intoxication look drunk. The, the, the overlap between inhalant intoxication and alcohol intoxication is significant. So individuals will, will actually present looking as if they're drunk. Um, the blood alcohol level will be zero. And there are a couple of other things that are part of inhaled intoxication that you are not likely to see in alcohol intoxication. Number one, alcohol is a depressant. Individuals who chronically use heavy amounts of alcohol can actually induce a depressive illness. There is such thing as alcohol-induced depressive disorder. Alcohol is a depressant. Euphoria is an actual DSM criterion of inhalant use disorder or specific, more specifically inhalant intoxication. Now individuals who are acutely intoxicated from alcohol can be disinhibited but they're not likely to come or present with euphoria, right? Quite the opposite. So that's one, one thing to look out for when somebody presents to you, quote unquote, looking drunk, um, is uh, do you believe it's due to a 
depressant or do you think it's due to a euphoriant, right? Because if it's the latter, it's much more likely to be inhalant intoxication. The other thing is that while there are neurological syndromes that can result um, through or as a, uh, as a result of the chronic use of alcohol, um, neurological symptoms are part of the acute intoxication syndrome for inhalants. So if there are neurological sequelae, um, the question you have to answer is, is it occurring in the third or fourth decade of life after sustained or continued use? That's consistent with the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which is a uh, syndrome that results from thiamine depletion due to the effects of alcohol, or are the neurological effects upon presentation during the acute intoxication syndrome? Because if that's the case, it's likely to be inhalant intoxication. And because of that, individuals who present are likely, at least on tests, to be younger than those who present um, uh, with behavioral changes due to alcohol. So inhalant intoxication, again, looks similar to alcohol intoxication with two things that usually come up on standardized exams to tease out one from the other. Number one, neurological effects of part of the acute syndrome uh, due to inhalants that is not the case for alcohol. Alcohol can induce neurologic effects but it's usually after sustained use that is heavy chronic use depletes vitamin B1 that is thiamine and that can result in the Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome which is a neurological syndrome. And then the other would be the euphoria as part of the intoxication phase individuals with alcohol intoxication tend not to present with euphoria. Alcohol does have an identified withdrawal phase. That is, when an individual either relatively or um, abruptly discontinues the use of alcohol, they can actually demonstrate signs of alcohol withdrawal. Right? Uh, headache, tremor, uh, GI effects, etc. cetera. Um, uh, they could become uh, diaphoretic or sweat. That is not the case for inhalants. Uh, there is no physiologic dependence for inhalant use and therefore there is no physiologic withdrawal state. Right, so that's another way to separate the two, uh, albeit outside of the acute intoxication phase. Any questions about alcohol versus inhalants? Um, let's talk a little bit about cannabis. Uh, cannabis intoxication, um, dry mouth, uh, conjunctival injection, bloodshot eyes, uh, and hunger, and sometimes slurred, uh, slurred um, speech. Um, and then there's behavioral as well, including anxiety and panic, including psychosis and paranoia. So those are the more common untoward effects of cannabis intoxication. There is a cannabis withdrawal phase. Um, cannabis withdrawal looks very, very similar to nicotine withdrawal. So individuals can be irritable, they can be anxious, and they can have somatic symptoms. Um, withdrawal from cannabis tends to have more somatic symptoms than withdrawal from nicotine. Uh, at least per the literature. Uh, and then the other one criterion that really does separate these two withdrawal phases out because there is tremendous overlap is that individuals who quit smoking uh, can and often do gain weight. The opposite for cannabis. Remember, cannabis intoxication, um, increase in appetite and weight gain. The withdrawal phase is weight loss. So. In one withdrawal phase, cannabis weight loss, and the other withdrawal phase, nicotine weight gain. Otherwise, cannabis and nicotine withdrawal look very, very similar. I mentioned cannabis intoxication. There is no such thing as nicotine intoxication. Right? People don't smoke cigarettes and present with behavioral disturbances. Uh, that's not the case for cannabis. Cannabis has an identified intoxication phase. 
but that's another way to separate these two drugs out or, or from one another. While there is an acute intoxication phase for cannabis, there is no such phase uh, called nicotine intoxication. Any questions about nicotine, cannabis, inhalants, or alcohol? I want to talk a little bit about providing a biopsychosocial treatment plan in such cases. If our characters in this movie are afflicted with any of the above, how can we help them once they are through the withdrawal phase, if there is in fact a withdrawal phase? In circumstances focused on cannabis and or um, inhalants, from a prescribing perspective, that is a biological perspective, there's not much more to do. All right, so from that biological focus of the biopsychosocial treatment plan, uh, inhale intoxication or inhalant use disorder now since they're out of the intoxication phase and there is no identified withdrawal phase for inhalants, the primary focus of the aftercare plan is AA or NA. Uh, it's going to be focused on the psychosocial habilitation. Um, as far as the biological part of that biopsychosocial treatment plan, there really are no medications that are going to improve outcomes. And the same holds true for cannabis. Uh, after the individual is through their cannabis withdrawal phase, and now you are looking at aftercare and you're formulating a biopsychosocial treatment plan, that treatment plan will be largely psychosocial habilitation, including AA or NA. There are no prescribed drugs that have consistently shown improved outcomes uh, for cannabis use disorder. On the other hand, uh, nicotine use disorder. Um, we could talk about the judicious use of medications, the prescribing, um, in addition to psychosocial rehab and other aspects of the psychosocial component of the treatment plan. Um, any ideas here in terms of medications that may be available uh, to the individual in the setting of nicotine use disorder recovery phase? So a couple of questions to ask here. Number one is, um, and this would, this would routinely occur in your assessment, um, is there any evidence of co-occurring depression? Because if there's established major depressive disorder, um, I think the prescriber here would consider a medication called bupropion. Uh, bupropion is a first-line antidepressant. Bupropion is an antidepressant that works by enhancing uh, both dopamine and norepinephrine in the central nervous system. And since those two neurotransmitters, dopamine and norepinephrine, are integral in the reward pathway, uh, they've been shown, uh, that is the medication has been shown to benefit individuals who uh, have nicotine use disorder. Now the vast majority of prescribing is for individuals to quit smoking or pick a quit date because the use of this agent, bupropion, reduces cravings for, alcohol, for, excuse me, for nicotine. However, even once they've gotten to that quit date and once they've gotten through their nicotine withdrawal, individuals with co-occurring depression uh, likely would benefit from the choice of antidepressant being the appropriate. So even in the aftercare phase, it's a consideration. Other FDA-approved medications, including Chantix and uh, nicotine replacement strategies, have their primary role during the withdrawal phase. Uh, so individuals, and I have to look at Chantix a little closer, uh, but uh, individuals will likely be prescribed these medications during withdrawal and then perhaps prescribed bupropion post-withdrawal with um, evidence of any co-occurring major depressive disorder.
Any questions about any of the drugs we talked about? All right. Well, uh, this past half hour was all focused on the, uh, the initial observation um, about the role of drugs, those vapors, and even the use of cannabis in one of the characters. Uh, anything else catch your eye in the cabin in the woods? Why does a person taking drugs uh, not affected by the uh, uh, inhalants? It's a great question. Um, that, that one I'm going to put all on Hollywood. Um, no clue whatsoever as to why the stoner uh, was somehow immune to the effects of the inhalants uh, in as much as we're case formulating this and the inhalant side is symbolic. Um, it would have been great if there was some neurophysiology or neurobiology to suggest that the use of one substance somehow protects from the use or the effects of another. That is not the case uh, for inhalants versus um, cannabis. So um, I don't have any medical reason as to why that would make sense. So I'm going to say this is, a, this is purely Hollywood here. So I'm going to ask a question then. Uh, and again, if you don't feel comfortable unmuting, please feel free to use the chat. What would you have chosen? I'm just interested in... You're not going to get away with uh, without putting something in the chat room. So uh, just like these teens were not allowed to simply leave that cabin saying, no, thank you, uh, after picking up an object. So you're going to go with the merman? All right, we got one merman. I'm not going to let people off the hook. I need at least a half dozen answers from the size of the group we have. So we're down. Okay, we got a zombie. Okay, we've got a werewolf. Okay. Two more. I think that was the zombie too, right? One more. Another merman. I still need one more. I need a new one. We kind of touched based on, on the merman earlier in the week and its role in psychiatry. Uh, every one of these characters actually has a direct relationship to, if not a chapter in the DSM-5, but a disorder um, in a chapter uh, in the current um, uh, edition of the DSM. So a, a couple in the time we have left is, uh, I think, um, good for review here. And maybe we'll start with the role of the zombie. Uh, anybody have any favorite zombie films? Again, if you're a little hesitant on mute, feel free to post it in the chat room. So not, not a favorite. So certainly around 1954, with uh, Tim Matheson authoring um, I Am Legend, the zombie culture really had a major shift. And the ideology or the roots of the zombie changed from voodoo to some manipulation by the medical field. Um, and that certainly um, was manifest in one of the more recent uh, I Am Legend remakes uh, 
uh, so titled I Am Legend, which uh, took place in the early 2000s. Uh, <clears throat> the Train to Busan was very good. So highly recommended, for the, especially for zombie enthusiasts who have not watched that movie. But then again, I think if you're a zombie enthusiast, you probably <clears throat> watched this already. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, I agree. I um, uh, was a big uh, Walking Dead fan as well, even though it's not a film. <clears throat> um, really, ever since 1954, uh, there's been a lot of focus on the role of the medical field and the narcissism of the physician as contributing to the zombie apocalypse. Uh, so um, there's certainly a role kind of looking at it from a meta perspective um, and coming to the um, <clears throat> conclusion that the medical field has played an active role in the evolution of the zombie and therefore uh, narcissism or narcissistic personality disorder certainly is part of every zombie movie that meets this, uh, meets this trope. Um, uh, Robert Neville is in fact a physician, so again, the most recent ad um, adaptation of Matheson's sem uh, seminal novel uh, holds true to this. Uh, in every one of these zombie movies, that is, even if you look at the franchise of I Am Legend, um, The Last Man on Earth starring Vincent Price, even The Omega Man with Charlton Heston, um, the sole survivor usually has major depressive disorder, if not co-occurring post-traumatic stress disorder. And even if we just look at the most recent one of these films, again, titled I Am Legend, starring Will Smith, uh, this is an individual who not only is battling with depression, but he is also having nightmares and flashbacks incident to the death of his wife and child. Uh, so uh, these movies and the zombie uh, certainly allow for discussion of that sole survivor of the last quote, quote man on earth, uh, end quote, um, and therefore are, uh, I think, um, films that could easily open up to the, uh, depressive, the, disorder, the depressive disorders chapter as well as the anxiety spectrum disorders chapter, including the trauma and stressor related disorders as PTSD is often um, manifest or depicted in these films. Um, there's more to it, and certainly we could pick this up if somebody would remind me on Monday. Uh, the, there's an additional layer, and I'll just throw that, uh, this out there as a teaser. Uh, there's an additional layer to all of this that gets to the etiology of the very disorders we've discussed as well. So um, we'll leave that to uh, uh, Monday's Q&A if somebody would remind me uh, next week to bring that up. Again, the etiology of these very disorders depicted in these movies contained in the movies as well. Then we have the werewolf. So, uh, any thoughts on the werewolf? Um, Joss Whedon's werewolf is one of the more creative wolfman characters. Um, uh, he's, he basically is a badass werewolf in this movie. So, um, I, I, would, I would be hesitant to pick it after seeing this the size and the uh, the um, agility of this thing, but um, thoughts on the werewolf and how that might parallel or impact teaching behavioral medicine. I think on the surface, the individual who, quote, changes into an animal, end quote, uh, upon what usually is a neutral stimulus, in this case, again, the metaphor of the moon, um, might present with aggressive behavior um, <clears throat> that, um, uh, at least on presentation, might not appear to be in the context of a, uh, um, another mental illness, a pre-existing condition. In as much as that might be the initial presentation, I think one of the things that the clinician should consider is a group of disorders formally referred to as the um, impulse control disorders. Uh, there are several impulse control disorders themselves having been reclassified in the DSM-5. Uh, but there's one that still is contained in that chapter uh, called um, 
um, I almost said impulse control NOS. It's not. It's um, and I'm blanking on the term now. Uh, good for me. Uh, let me. Let me review the impulse control disorders in general. Um, number one. Actually, let me put it in the form of a question. Uh, if somebody presented to you with the uh, clinically significant behavior of not being able to resist the impulse to set fires, what might you consider to be their affliction? It's a condition called, yes, thank you in the uh, chat room, that is correct, pyromania, right? Similarly, somebody presents to you with um, the clinically significant behavior of the inability to resist the impulse to steal. Okay, you clipped them in the and it's kleptomania, good. Okay, and then the third one uh, is the condition I was referring to before, the intermittent explosive disorder, where individuals actually have these episodic uh, expo um, explosive behaviors uh, that are prompted by stimuli that are deemed to not warrant that overreaction that is intermittent explosive disorder. There are two other conditions um, that are currently published in this chapter in the DSM-5. Uh, however, we're not going to review them because they are child adolescent illnesses and I simply uh, am not going to be able to talk much. Um, about those conditions, including um, oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder. So uh, these are two uh, child adolescent disorders that were taken from the child chapter of the DSM-4 uh, uh, and then pre reclassified in this chapter in the DSM-5. So the adult psychopathologies total three here, um, pyromania, kleptomania, and intermittent explosive disorder, and certainly the werewolf or wolfman uh, does appear to be afflicted with uh, intermittent explosive disorder, at least upon initial presentation. Again, there's more, uh, a little bit more to this um, in how this condition uh, and the way it's classified might relate back to the other disorders in this chapter, specifically pyromania and kleptomania, a little beyond the scope of our discussion today. However, if you want to bring this to the Q&A next week, simply remind me, again, how this one condition of intermittent explosive disorder may relate to pyromania and kleptomania through uh, lycanthropy, that is, the study of werewolves and certainly the depiction of werewolves in film. The other thing I want to say about this condition um, is that even though this might be the initial presentation, um, in various wearable films there is a backstory that is usually created, and that includes the original, uh, and that is um, the main character who, quote, turns into an animal, end quote, is provided the backstory of a mental disorder, and the mental disorder does appear to be bipolar disorder. Uh, again, a little bit beyond the scope. Uh, of what we're talking about today, but I think the clinical pearl here is that if the individual actually is discovered to have had mania at any point in their past, um, the clinician must attribute the intermittent ex and explosive behavior to that pre-existing condition until proven otherwise. So, uh, all right, we'll leave it here. Again, um, we're still in the middle right now. We're actually getting to the midpoint of our 31 nights uh, of Halloween didactic. Uh, so next week, if um, despite the fact that The Cabin in the Woods happens to be the 31 nights film for today, yeah, if you wanted to, I mentioned this before, every single monster written in, into this film, every iconic monster in US, U.S. horror filmography, has a place in our curriculum as introducing, if not a chapter in the DSM, an illness within one of those chapters, every single one of these monsters. So if you want to bring any of that to the Q&A session, I'd be more than happy to discuss any of these monsters that you saw in that elevator and how the background of that monster, knowing the roots of that individual monster contributes to the teaching of behavioral medicine and psychiatry. So we'll leave it out there um, to be picked up next week. 
And if there are no further questions, uh, everybody have a great weekend.